You are listening to Hope and Healing, a resource of Macon FBC. Tune in each week as we release a message from God's Word that will bring the hope and healing of Jesus Christ to your soul. It is the Word of God that restores the soul, that makes wise the simple, that rejoices the heart, and that energizes our life. It is the Word of God that pierces to the deepest, darkest corners of our troubled hearts in order to bring the soothing warmth of Christ's healing power. We hope that you will be encouraged and equipped to follow Jesus as you experience the hope and healing of Christ with us. In this nine-week series, Pastor Phil Bray applies Exodus 25-31 through to our lives, showing us how to live in communion with God. This section of Scripture explores how to live in the presence of God and experience the joy and peace of His never-ending love. Open your Bibles, if you would, to Exodus chapters 28 and 29. As you know, we didn't finish uh, this text last Sunday, a uh, bit off a little bit more than we could chew in one sermon time frame, uh, and so we're going to finish studying this text this morning. In fact, one of the most uh, asked questions I received this week was, are you going to read both chapters again? <laughs> no, my unspiritual children, I am not going to do that. My children were the ones who asked me that question quite a bit. Uh, But no, I'm just kidding. No, I am not going to read both chapters again. I am going to read, though, from chapter 29. Uh, We're going to start there at verse 43 and read through verse 46. So Exodus chapter 29, verse 43. This is really the summation of this text and, and kind of reminding us what we're getting at here. He says, And I will meet there with the sons of Israel, and it shall be consecrated by my glory. And I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. I will also consecrate Aaron and his sons to minister as priests to me. And I will dwell among the sons of Israel, and I will be their God. And they shall know that I am the Lord their God, who brought them out of the land of Egypt, that I might dwell among them. I am Yahweh their God. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for the gift of Scripture. We thank you for speaking to us and making it clear to us who you are, who we are, and how we can be near you, how we we can be with you. You are so kind and you are so good. Father, I pray this morning that as we look at this text of Scripture again, that you would open our eyes and our hearts to receive your word. I pray that we would not be distracted, whether from our phones or from people sitting around us. I pray, Heavenly Father, that we would be focused, that we would be attentive, that we would hear your words for what, as what they are. Your words, the living God of heaven is speaking to us with this text of scripture. And I pray, Lord, that we would hear and obey. Father, we pray that you would consecrate us. That you would set us apart, that you would sanctify us, that you would make us holy as you are holy. Father, we want to be those who dwell with you. We want to be those who reflect your glory and your beauty to this community. Father, please help us. Please empower us with your spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As you know, we've been studying the tabernacle, and if you're new with us this morning, we have been, over the last two years, studying through the book of Exodus, uh, striving to understand who God is and how he reacts and interacts with us, his people, and we've come in these last few weeks to the tabernacle narrative, and this is really not so much a narrative as a description of this tent, a description of this very special construction. Uh, in fact, its its uniqueness, its holiness, its its preciousness in redemptive history is seen in the fact that it is has so much text assigned to it. 
to the description of it. And so it's not something that we should just read carelessly over. It's not something that we should just chalk up to uh, the past and the way that God used to interact with people that no longer is relevant for us. We must keep in mind that all Scripture is inspired by God, breathed out by God, and useful, profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Even passages that at first glance seem really hard and irrelevant, it's not. We simply need to study a little bit harder. We need to think a little bit more carefully. God wanted us to read and understand and apply these words to our lives. So what is it that these two chapters of descriptions about the priests mean for us. I think this passage explains three facts about the Old Testament priests in order to show us how to live, how to dwell in the presence of God. I think that's what's the point here. That's what he's driving at. What does it mean, what does it look like to live in the presence of God, to dwell in the presence of God? You see, the reality is the church is in a sense, the fulfillment of this tabernacle. We are the dwelling place of the Most High. Ever since Pentecost, the Spirit of God has entered into our lives as people. God dwells among us. He is with us, empowering us, driving us, leading us, strengthening us, encouraging us, convicting us, helping us. This is what He does. He is with us, rejoicing our hearts. So what does it mean then? What, is it, what, what then do we do as people who are indwelt by God, people who come together and in community as the dwelling place of the Most High? What does it look like? That's what this passage, I think, is about. I think sometimes we enter into Christianity too flippantly. We have reduced Christianity to an event you attend once a week. Put a few dollars in the offering plate, listen to a boring sermon, sing a few songs that you've heard on the radio at some point in the distant past, and, and then you've done your duty, you've checked your box, you've done your Christian thing. Or we say, you know, I, need, I know I need to get back to church, as if the simply showing up at this meeting is going to somehow give you points with God. It's, it's not, that's not it at all. Following Jesus is life, it's, it's, it's you living out your life, living with God, being indwelt by the spirit of the living God is something that radically transforms every aspect of your life, every relationship of your life, every choice and decision that you make, everything you do, everything you think, everything you say is impacted and altered and transformed by God. Following Jesus is so much more than we typically think. And I think this passage helps us understand it. So let's look at it again. Three facts about the Old Testament priests in order to show us how to dwell in the presence of God. As we looked at last week, we remember that priests of God are clothed in the glory and beauty of Jesus Christ. We spent quite a bit of time in there, so I, I want to just move on to the second point. As priests to God, we are identified and we are identified with and represented by Christ. As priests to God, we are identified with and represented by Christ. Look at chapter 28, verse 12. Chapter 28, verse 12. He says, and you shall put the two stones on the shoulder pieces of the ephod as stones of memorial for the sons of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before Yahweh on his two shoulders for a memorial. And if you skip down to verse 29, you see these same words. And Aaron shall carry the names of the sons of Israel in the breastpiece of judgment over his heart when he enters the holy place for a memorial before Yahweh continually. What is he talking about? What is the significance here? Aaron is the high priest. He is the priest of priests. And notice something unique about his attire. He bears two onyx stones. And on each of these stones are written the, the names of the tribes of Israel. There's six names on one stone, six names on the other stone. Not only are these two stones carrying, literally wearing the names of Israel, but he has 12 other stones attached to his breastpiece. And each stone represents a different 
tribe of Israel. And why does he do this? Because Aaron stands in as the representative of Israel. He is Israel collected in one person, so to speak. He is the representative. He is Israel standing in the presence of God on behalf of the rest of the people. The Lord sees Aaron and remembers all of Israel. All of Israel is present, corporately represented in him. He stands as the single entity in whom all the other people of the nation are represented. What is true of them is true of him. What is true of him is true of them. In Leviticus chapter 10, verses one through seven, you see the beginning of the priesthood and how they begin to do their duties. And the glory of God comes to the tabernacle and fills the tabernacle and fire comes out from the presence of the Lord and it consumes the sacrifice on the altar. And when that takes place, everyone is amazed and everyone is in awe and everyone is, is, is just standing back with their mouths agape, their eyes wide open. This is a wondrous thing to behold. The glory of God that consumed the top of Mount Sinai is now consuming and, and dwelling in their midst in this tabernacle place where there were four sons of Aaron. The two oldest sons, Nadab and Abihu, got very excited. For some reason, they took incense and put it on censers, and they offered unauthorized fire before the Lord. Basically, they made a sacrifice that God told them, didn't tell them to do. They were doing things their own way, and instantly fire came out from the presence of the Lord and consumed these two priests. They fell down dead, completely consumed by fire. And very quickly, Moses turns to Aaron and says, do not weep, do not rend your garments, do not not go through the act of mourning. Look at what he says, look at Leviticus chapter 10, look at verse six and seven. Then Moses said to Aaron and his sons Eleazar and Ithamar, Do not uncover your heads, nor tear your clothes, so that you may not die, and that he may not become wrathful against all the congregation. It's a very significant statement. These two boys, whom I'm sure Aaron loved very much, he's not allowed to mourn for them. He's not allowed to weep for them in this moment. And Moses tells him, the congregation will weep for them, but you cannot in this moment Why? Because you are consecrated to the Lord. You stand before the Lord. You are in the presence of the Lord. You are separate from that which is common, that which is sinful. You are holy to the Lord. If you do this, you will die. And not only will you die, but then you will bring about God's judgment upon the people of Israel. Now, how is that right? It's because Aaron stands in as the representative of Israel so that what happens to Aaron will happen to them. What happens to them will happen to Aaron. Do you see what I'm saying? There is a unity between the priest and the people. There is a connection, a oneness between the high priest who represents the people and the people so that how God interacts with the high priest is how God interacts with the people. That's what's going on in this place. His guilt becomes their guilt. Their guilt becomes his guilt. And it's his responsibility to make atonement. Look at chapter 28, verse 36. You shall also make a plate of pure gold and shall engrave on it like the engravings of a seal, holy to Yahweh. You shall fasten it to a blue cord and it shall be on the turban and it shall be at the front of the turban and it shall be on Aaron's forehead and Aaron shall take away, he shall carry away the iniquity of the holy things which the sons of Israel consecrate with regard to all these holy gifts and it shall always be on his forehead that they may be accepted before the Lord. Aaron's responsibility is to come before the Lord on behalf of Israel and carry away, remove the guilt and the sin and the, and, and the stain of rebellion away from the things that, go, that the children of Israel are giving to God as an offering so that their 
so that they will be accepted. He's the go-between. He, functioning as their holy representative, can go into the presence of God. He can make atonement for their sin and carry away their guilt so that they will be accepted before God. That's the function of the high priest. I hope you see where this is going. Turn to Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who cannot sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in all things as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore draw near with confidence to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and might find grace to help in time of need. We can find acceptance. We can find forgiveness. We can find mercy. We can find help and strength in time of need. Why? Because our high priest who lives in the resurrected glorious body that he received at the resurrection stands at the right hand of God constantly interceding for us. He stands as our legal head, our representative before God. And because he is accepted, we are accepted. Because he is innocent, we are innocent. Because he can enter into the presence of God, we can enter into the presence of God. Jesus has made us clean. He goes in our place and makes atonement. Look at Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 9. And having been made perfect, he became to all those who obey him the source of eternal salvation, being designated by God as a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. In the same way that Aaron went into the holy place in order to make atonement, in order to provide forgiveness and acceptance for Israel in God's presence to save them, so Jesus has gone in and he provides eternal, unending salvation for all whom he represents. Look at Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 11. But when Christ appeared as high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, and not through the blood of goats and calves, but through his own blood. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse? Cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. Maybe, maybe you're sitting here this morning and you're bored because this doesn't mean anything to you. This is not significant to you. All of this talk of priests, all of this talk of blood, all of this talk of sacrifices, all of this talk of, of Old Testament rituals, it, it's so irrelevant, it's so uninteresting. You're only here because someone dragged you here. You're only here because uh, for whatever reason you you think I I should go. But this this is really, it doesn't impact your life. You're actually thinking more about who's going to win the game this afternoon. I get that. But I want you to understand something. Every single human being on the planet was created by one God. One God. There's not a multiplicity of gods. It's not a smorgasbord in which you can go up to the buffet and choose whichever God you like. There's one God that exists. The Bible is very clear. Creation is very clear. There is one God. And this one God says, turn to me and be saved. All the ends of the earth. Why? Because your sin, your rebellion, your selfishness, your lusts, your anger, your greed, your covetousness, your your sin separates you from God. And it doesn't just separate you from the joy of his presence in this life, it separates you from God eternally. There is a place called hell that all people will go to 
who do not trust in Jesus Christ, who do not bow their knees to Jesus Christ. That's a reality. You don't have to like it. You, you, can, you can look at me and you can say, well, I just think that's ridiculous. I, I just don't think that, that, that God would do that. You can think that all you want to, but that doesn't change the reality. The, the reality is this. You and I will stand before God, the God who created us, and give an account. And if you stand there alone, you will perish. If you do not stand there with the high priest of Jesus Christ, you will perish. There's only one person who has gone into the very throne room of God with blood that forgives sin, and it's Jesus. I wish that I had the power to convince you, but I don't. I wish that I had the power to speak words in such a beautiful, clever, emotionally packed way that you would be instantly drawn in. But I don't. My fear is that we sit here with hard hearts. Why are you not trusting in Christ? Why are you not running from your sin and, and falling before Jesus and begging for his forgiveness? I, one day, one day you will see the truth of these things. Only those identified with Jesus Christ will be a part of God's eternal dwelling place. There's no forgiveness. There's no eternal life. There's no hope outside of Jesus Christ crucified and risen for your sins. You must trust in him. And I urge you with all that is within me to stop putting it off. We live foolishly thinking tomorrow is guaranteed. But there is no tomorrow. There is now. And if you draw breath one hour from now, it is because of God's gracious kindness. You don't have to wait to the end of the sermon. You don't have to come up to the front and talk to me. You don't have to go to the back and talk to Pastor Sam. You can, you can bow your head even now and you can say, oh God, I'm a sinner and I recognize that Jesus is the Savior and Jesus is the High Priest. Jesus is the only one who can forgive me. Lord, please save me on behalf of Jesus. Please let Jesus be my representative and God will save you. He will forgive you and he will send his spirit to you and he will begin to change you from the inside out. He will begin to change your desires and your wants and your wishes. But you must bow your knees to Jesus. And we can come up with a host of reasons why we need to wait and questions that we need answered first. And all of that is simply us refusing to say, not my will, but yours be done. The window of mercy is open today, right now. It may be closed tomorrow. Please, don't wait. It is only through the high priest of Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who was slain to take away our sins that we are saved. Trust in him. The third point, as priests of God, we are set apart to reflect the light of Christ. Chapter 29 uses the word consecration over and over and over and over again. And the word means to make holy or to set apart for divine use. The priests were separated from other Israelites. They were devoted to Yahweh for his purposes. And holiness 
is that connection to God. So how was it that they were separated? What, what, what happened that pulled them apart and made them unique? As priests, we've talked about this, as priests ourselves, every, every one of us who is saved in Jesus Christ, we're not high priests, Jesus is the high priest, but we are the other priests who represent God to the nations. So what is it that happens to consecrate us? The first thing that happens in chapter 29 I don't know. I feel like I'm belaboring a point. I, I, I think it's more important. Right? Let me just say this, and then I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to end, because I want, I want us to end with you having an opportunity to respond to Jesus. In this text... The first thing that separates someone out, the first thing that pulls you out and makes you different, makes you part of this group of people who dwell in the presence of God is the substitutionary sacrifice. If you look at verses one through three, he talks about how you're going to bring these animals along with some bread to the tabernacle. And then look at verse four. And you shall bring Aaron and his sons to the doorway of the tent of meeting. And you shall wash them with water. And, and then you shall dress them. But look down at verse 10. He says, then you shall bring the bull before the tent of meeting. And Aaron and his sons shall lay their hands on the head of the bull. And you shall slaughter the bull before the Lord at the doorway of the tent of meeting. And you shall take some of the blood of the bull and put it on the horns of the altar with your finger and you shall pour out the blood at the base of the altar. And then in verse 15 and 16, you read the same thing. They're to lay their hands on the head of the animal. And then in verses 19 and 20, you read the same thing. They're to lay their hands on the head of the animal. What's happening? The sin of these people is being transferred to the animal. And then the animal is being killed in the place of the person. The animal dies as a substitute for the person. Instead of the person dying, the animal dies. And when the animal dies, that sin that's been transferred to the animal is wiped out and they can now enter into the presence of God they can serve God they can dwell with God you can only dwell with God you can only enter into the gladness of the presence of God you can only experience the peace and the joy and the and the delight that your soul is aching for in the presence of God the world is constantly telling you that joy and gladness and peace and all of this contentment that we're longing for, it's only had in the tangible, immediately experienceable pleasures that this world offers. If you have this relationship, if you have this money, if you have this, if you, if you have this vacation, if you have this job status, if you have whatever it is, you fill in the blank. If I had that, then I would get happy, but you never get there. It's like a carrot on a stick that's constantly pulled out right before you get there, right before you can lay your hands on it. You, you, you start to feel that gladness through the experience, but then it's pulled away, and you're left aching and wanting more. I'm telling you that that carrot on the stick is leading you farther and farther and farther away from true joy. It's leading you away from God. God is the epicenter of joy. He's the epicenter of gladness. Your heart was made to treasure him and delight in him. So we keep chasing these things and these things separate us from God. But Christ has come as our high priest, but he's also come as the lamb. These animals represent Christ as well because our sin is transferred to Jesus' head. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21, it says, he became sin so that we might become the righteousness of God. There, there's a transfer of, there's, there's a sweet exchange that takes place. Jesus takes our sin on himself as if it were his own. And he goes to the cross and he drinks the wrath of God. He absorbs the judgment of God for our sin. And that sin is wiped out. It's gone. It's removed. It's obliterated. As far as the east is, it's gone. It's, it's no more. And you are accepted before God because of what Jesus did. His blood poured out. His blood carried into the most holy place poured out is evidence that your sins have been paid for. So I come back to this point. 
Would you enter into this priesthood? Would you, would you dwell with God? Would you find gladness of heart? Would you find joy for your soul? Would you be satisfied? Then you need to stop drinking out of the, the mud puddles of this earth and come to the clear, cold, refreshing fountain of life in Jesus Christ. But we keep slurping up the slime of this world as if it's going to satisfy. It won't. It never will. You can go to a different puddle that looks a little cleaner than the last puddle you slurped in, but you're still going to come away unsatisfied and sick. You need Christ. And only if Christ opens your eyes will you see that. So I, I plead with you to beg of Jesus to open your eyes and save you this morning. I plead with you. To kneel before God and say, Jesus, save me. For by grace we are saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Salvation is the gift of God. Through faith, through trusting in Jesus Christ it comes. How will you respond to this? Some of us we simply need to give thanks and praise to God because we are forgiven and we, we know how wretched we are. We know how black our, our hearts were and are at times and we are so thankful that Jesus cleanses us. And some of us in this room have not yet surrendered to Jesus. We have not yet trusted in Jesus. We're still slurping out of the mud puddles of this world. I would that you would come and be saved. I'll be standing at the front. Pastor Sam will be standing at the back. You don't have to come talk to us, but I, I urge you to. I urge you to, to say, Lord, I want you more than anything else. I need you. And come to this place and follow Jesus. This is Hope and Healing, a resource by Making FBC. We hope you enjoyed this message and pray that it brought hope and healing to your heart. For more resources like this, visit hopeformacon.com. I'm your host, Chris Stoner. Thank you for listening.